Hello, church family. My name is Michael Gentry, and this is The Recap. We were blessed with two distinct messages from Pastor Covington this past Sunday, both of them encouraging our growth in the Lord but from two different perspectives. At the eight o'clock service, Pastor Covington preached from the topic, brighten the corner where you are, which those of us not of a certain age learned is the title of a hymn popularized by jazz great Ella Fitzgerald. At the 1045 service, Pastor Covington preached from the topic, there is hope for slow learners coming from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. This is the passage of scripture that talks about the two disciples on the Emmaus Road, who had left from Jerusalem on the Sunday evening after Jesus' resurrection and were walking back to a home some seven miles outside of the city. As they were walking, they were mournfully discussing the unbelievably dramatic events that had unfolded over the past few days, namely Jesus' death on the cross and then the claim by Mary Magdalene and the other women disciples that the tomb was empty and Jesus had risen. As they walked along, Jesus appeared to them as a stranger and asked what they were talking about. And they, finding it strange that he was unaware of what surely would have been the trending topic on social media and on cable news, began to explain to him how this Jesus, who they followed, was crucified and how they had previously hoped that he was the Messiah until he was killed. And then how the women and their crew were claiming he was alive again, a claim these men could not even process which is probably why they left town in the first place. And Jesus, posing as a stranger, replied to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and then to enter into his glory? And he began to break down the scriptures to them, explaining why the Messiah would have had to die for sins and how it is that he could be raised from the dead things that Jesus had already taught them while they were following him. Pastor Covington's point with this text was that we are all slow learners in some regard. None of us grasp everything quickly. And especially when it comes to the Lord, there are things that we have failed to learn despite God providing us the information and things we have information about, but have failed to apply to our lives and our actions. Yet, even though it's not okay to be ignorant, God can still meet us where we are and get us to where we need to be if we are willing. Amen, somebody. But here is the hope in the text Slow learners, slow learners who want, amen, to seriously live and learn Christ in spite of frustration and disappointment and immaturity. If you have an interest in Christ so much that you want to invite him into your space, come on somebody. Jesus will come in and he'll start with information, but he won't leave until there's an impartation. Amen, somebody. I just said something, maybe went over your head. I said, if you invite Jesus in. He will give you some information, but he will not leave you until he gives you an impartation that will leave you moving toward transformation. If if you let him in, he'll reveal himself for who he really is. If you let him in, he'll reconfirm his identity through his word. If you let him in, he'll restore your hope, give you joy. If you let him in, he'll give you a testimony. The Bible says in verse 33 that they went back to Jerusalem. They walked seven miles. 
in the wrong direction, but after they knew who Jesus was, they turned around, that's called repentance, and they walked back seven miles telling everybody, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive, he walks with me, and he talks with me. He's alive. So you can tell that we had us a good time in the Lord at the 1045 service. But just as that message was encouraging us about where we are in our walk with Christ, the sermon at the eight o'clock service encouraged us to walk with Christ where we are. And thank God we're blessed with a pastor who is gifted and skilled to such a degree that he can pull from Scripture that which is easily overlooked. Because our message came from Philippians 4.22, which simply reads, All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. This seemingly unimportant verse is part of the Apostle Paul's closing in his letter to the Philippians. And as such, most of us probably would read past it. But Pastor pointed out something significant. Paul states that all the saints of Caesar's household join him in paying greetings to the church at Philippi. Now, Caesar, of course, was one of the titles of the Roman emperors. And the emperor at that time was Nero. Nero is remembered in history as one of the more vile, violent, and depraved of all the depraved emperors of Rome. And he was particularly violent toward Christians, as Pastor pointed out. In Nero's palace were hundreds and hundreds of workers of various sorts and various levels. Some of them slaves, some of them employees some of them Jewish and of other cultural backgrounds from within the empire. And their positions ranged from cooks to teachers to soldiers and everything in between. And we can actually make sense of that when we look at our own government today. In Washington, D.C., we have the three seats of government, the White House, where the executive branch sits, the Capitol building, where the legislative branch sits, and the Supreme Court, where the judicial branch sits. Now, outside of the main governmental officials, the president and vice president, Congress, and the Supreme Court justices, think of all the other people who work in those buildings or work in the surrounding government buildings or work for the people who work in those buildings. You have everything from law clerks and congressional aides to custodians and maintenance workers. Well, that's the same kind of thing that we see with what Paul calls Caesar's household, because Caesar is the government. Now you add to that imagery, the fact that a large portion of those working within the palatial grounds in Rome were slaves, which was also true of Washington DC prior to 1862. Now, here's the kicker. According to Paul, a number of those working in Caesar's household were Christians. Of that huge number of people serving in Nero's palace, some of them were of that group of people who believed Jesus of Nazareth to be the son of God, king of kings and lord of lords the very group of people whom Nero enjoyed murdering. Now, at the time of this letter, Paul is in Rome under house arrest. He was initially apprehended by the Roman authorities a few years earlier in Jerusalem because of a riot against him by some of the Jewish people. This is recorded in the book of Acts starting in chapter 21. His incarceration there became almost like protective custody because a plot had risen among the Jewish leaders to get their hands on him and kill him. And because of that, he was sent to Caesarea, 
where he was kept under guard for two years, but still allowed the freedom of interaction with his friends and fellow disciples. During that time, of course, he proclaimed and defended the gospel to all, to the Roman officials who oversaw his incarceration, to the guards who kept watch over him, and to the Jewish leaders who were trying to have him killed. Eventually, a trial was spurred on by the Jewish religious leaders in an effort to get him sent back to Jerusalem where they could execute him. But Paul, who was born a Roman citizen, appealed to have his case brought before the emperor, which would be like appealing to the Supreme Court for us. Now, the reason Paul appeared, appealed to Caesar was not because he feared death, as he said in Acts 25 and 11, but because there was no cause for the Jewish leaders to imprison him or execute him, which was their goal. So with the option being to be handed over to the Jews or be kept under guard by the Romans, Paul chose the latter. This decision to appeal to the emperor led to Paul being brought as a prisoner to Rome, which in itself was a very eventful trip, according to Acts chapters 27 and 28. And as a Christian prisoner, Paul's presence in Rome eventually led to him being beheaded several years later under that same emperor Nero. And that's what Paul was referring to in 2 Timothy 4 and 6, when he wrote, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand. But while he was there in Rome, under house arrest, in chains, under the watchful eye of guards, he was still able to communicate and correspond with the churches. He was able to have unlimited guests. And he was able to teach and preach from his confines. And with that small measure of quote unquote freedom, Paul went to work. The very last verse in Acts, Acts 28, 31 says, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And this went on for several years. He proclaimed the gospel to Jewish leaders in Rome, convincing and converting some of them. He helped strengthen the Roman church, which he had longed to do, having written his powerful letter to them a few years prior, which we now know as the book of Romans. And he wrote half of his letters, those being the books Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus and Philippians. And this was the very point of pastor's message. Wherever you are, whatever situation you are in, brighten the corner where you are. Brighten, brighten the corner where you are. Give the best. Listen, listen, stop wishing for better days and handle where you are now. Go and tell somebody, make the best of where you are now. Look at somebody and tell them, do the best you can where you are now. See, if you handle your now correctly, you will prepare, come on somebody, yourself to be ready for your next. But if you cannot handle your now, you will never be able to do a good job in your next. So you've got to learn how to brighten the corner where you are. You've got to give the best of your love now. Now, let's be real for a second. For some of us, there are decisions we've made that had less than ideal results. And we may tend to think if I had made the right decision, then I would be in a better place today. And that may be a correct assessment of the past, but it's not necessarily a correct assessment of the present because you have to remember there are plenty of possible outcomes for any decision, but this is the one God chose for you 
now, which also means that regardless of the decision making of the past, God still has a plan for you now. So whatever situation God has chosen for you now, serve him, glorify him, help build his kingdom right there in that situation now. Or maybe you are an individual who had certain plans and views for how life was supposed to go and you don't feel that you are where you meant to be or have gained what you intended to have or are doing what you hope to be doing at this point. But the previous statement is true for you as well. Wherever you are is where God chose you to be. Do God's work there because in the end, you will have accomplished far more with his plan than you would have with your plan. If Paul had been preoccupied by the fact that his freedom had been taken away, then he would not have seen the opportunity that God set before him. And then where would we be without those books that he wrote while in chains? Now, as we look at the verse pastor preached from, we can see the other element to all of this. Not only was Paul brightening his corner, but so were all the Christians in Caesar's household. Working under, working under an emperor who enjoyed killing Christians, these Christians were still unashamed of the gospel of Christ. They lived out their faith even in a hostile setting where they could have felt more secure hiding their faith. They lived out their faith even as slaves and servants, people who could have felt that their lot in life was unfair and that they would rather be anywhere else in anything else besides a slave in Caesar's household. Yet in that state, they lived out their faith and they did so to such a degree that Paul, a prisoner, knew and fellowshiped with all of them. And that's another point that pastor made. When you are where you're supposed to be doing what you're supposed to be doing, you will see that God has placed other brothers and sisters in that same place who can help you and whom you can be of help to. Because we're all in it together and God is working through all of us together to accomplish his plans. Number one, you're there to serve. I say you're there to serve. I say you're there to serve. Wherever it is, if it's a job you don't like, you're there to serve. Until God removes you or you quit, you're there to serve. Come on, somebody. If you got a boss that's crazy, amen, find a way to serve him. But also, watch this, you're there to shine. Let your light so shine. That's what Paul and Silas did in Acts chapter 16. That's what Paul did all through the book of Philippians. He allowed the light of his testimony and his life to shine and to reflect and give strength to other people. You're there, to, you're there to serve, you're there, but also you're there salt. Now, 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 now salt uh, gives flavor. But salt also irritates. Some folk, you flavor, you accent them, but other folk, you irritate. And one way you irritate them is by being consistently a saint. So pastor's message charged us to serve where we are, whether that situation is desirable or not. Shine where we are, meaning to live out our faith so that God can be glorified even in that environment. And be the salt of the earth where we are, to be willing to be used for the good of all, even if it prompts a negative reaction by some. Are we willing? As you ask yourself that question, remember, we can't change the fact that we are in the corner where we are. We can only change our perspective 
and decide whether or not we are going to let God use us to brighten that corner. So are we willing? That's all for me. I've got some videos to edit, but we'll meet again next time on the recap.